this is, I, uh, I think, a, uh, in some ways a rather lighter paper in the sense of being um, just some sort of slightly random reflections rather than anything very systematic, uh, occasioned mainly by um, the uh, celebrations of the King James Version in 2011 uh, when there was a lot of interest in it and therefore in biblical translation. Um, and um, I thought that there were two questions that were often in the air around the study of the King James Version, uh, which I'm going to talk about rather briefly, before going on to two questions that I thought ought to have been asked and actually weren't, uh, and I think generally aren't asked, though both of them were asked briefly by Charlotte this morning, in fact, uh, and I'll be developing some of the things in effect that she said, um, though we haven't um, collaborated on this in any way. Um, the King James Version, of course, was treated in 2011 uh, in an idealised or even one could say idolised way <laughs> as a kind of uh, holy object in itself. And many people raised no questions at all about it other than why can't we have it back? Um, and the, the fact they ask that indicates to what an extent in the churches we haven't got it any longer. It still appears, um, I mean, certainly in my own Anglican church, it appears at carol services and at other sort of rather stylized events. But for weekly use, one of the more modern translations is generally used, as in, as in the Roman Catholic Church, and indeed in most of the Protestant churches uh, in general in Britain, um, other more modern versions are used. And it seems to me that's come about um, by, because of an answer to two questions. Now, the first one is a question which we've been dealing with a good deal today, and that I don't want to say too much more about because I'm no expert on it, the question of literalism. How far should a translation be literal? Uh, or how far should you be conveying the underlying message in a way comprehensible to the audience, even if that means departing from what some would describe as a literal rendering? Because just what we mean by literal is deeply contested and very difficult to define. It doesn't for anybody, I think, nowadays mean word for word in the sense of a crib or interlinear. It means something a bit more sophisticated than that. Um, but it does mean um, something which is not capable of being described as functional equivalence or dynamic equivalence in the sort of NIDA mode. Um, and on the whole, functional equivalence has won out in biblical translation. So that although there are, um, particularly in the States, some particularly evangelical versions that aspire to be very literal, though they probably don't succeed in being, but do, which do try for almost word-for-word word renderings. Most uh, mainstream churches, um, certainly in Europe, uh, and in probably in most of the rest of the world, have opted for a kind of translation, which is what most translators nowadays just call translation. In other words, trying to render, as um, uh, Marta was describing to us this morning, trying to render in one language what's said in another without loss of meaning, so far as that can possibly be done and without any prejudice at all in favour of proceeding word by word. And this seems to me to have largely won out. I've given some examples of it, um, but I won't labour them now. Um, it does mean that in translations for cultures very far removed from the original setting, you have to exercise quite a bit of ingenuity so that, um, for example, um, in a translation of a Papua New Guinea, figs may be translated as bananas um, because they are, as it were, the equivalent local fruit, one might say. Uh, but no big theoretical issue seems to me to be raised really by the need to do that kind of thing. So uh, although I think this has been much discussed, um, literalism doesn't seem to me to be a very live issue in many ways in much modern biblical translation. It seems to have won out, by and large. Um, of course, the definition of literal is, is difficult, um, but I think most of us on a day-to-day -day basis know what we would mean by calling a translation more or less literal. And I've just cited as an example from another sphere altogether, um, Tacitus's famous foreword judgment on the Emperor Galba, whom he described as capax imperii nisi imperasset, which means literally, he had a capacity for ruling if he had not ruled, but that doesn't perhaps convey awfully much. 
less literally, perhaps more comprehensibly, he had much potential as an emperor if only he had never become one, which I think does capture what's being said about Galba. Or less literally still, we might say in modern English, he had a great future behind him, uh, which is, departs a good deal from the original, but still conveys the same sort of sense of disappointed hopes. Now, modern biblical translation normally goes about as far as the second of these approaches, very rarely as far as the third, though some of those things in the word do seem to me to go um, that bit further. Um, but um, that's literalism, and I think it's uh, not at all a dead issue, but it's an issue on which uh, the jury is not out, in the sense in modern biblical translation is not literal in any of the sort of bad meanings of literal that one recognises. The other question that does get asked, and did get asked around the King James Version anniversary, is a question about register and style and things like that. Uh, the question whether the Bible should be translated in a dignified and somewhat archaic way to convey a sense of seriousness and importance, or whether it should be in ordinary English to convey the sense that, as um, another work of this time only 50 years ago, Honest to God, put it, the beyond is in our midst. Um, in other words, that uh, God speaks, to use the Jewish phrase, in the language of the children of men, so that you translate the Bible into common everyday speech rather than into an elevated and special hieratic style. And this question, which is right, of those two options, have certainly been raised a lot about liturgical language in the last 50 years or so, and recently in the question of the translation of the new missal, which um, Nick has been ta talking about um, earlier today. Um, the King James Version is often defended on the grounds of its dignity and its ability to put in us in touch with transcendence, where modern versions are praised for their capacity to bring God into our everyday lives. So which of those do you want to do? Uh, can you perhaps do both at once? Well, people generally tend to think you can't. And of course, translating into very modern language has the hazard that with the Bible translation, which is generally expected to last quite a long time, some of the modern language dates very quickly. And so you end up with a version which isn't in modern English, but in the English of 30 years ago, which is perhaps a worse outcome than the King James. Uh, and I, I've just quoted the rather famous example of um, the J.B. Phillips version of the Gospels, which in 57 was a highly innovative translation, completely avoiding literalism and coming into modern speech, uh, which faced with friend go up higher in the parable of the wedding guest, um, rendered it, my dear fellow, we have a much better seat for you than that, <laughs> which it rather now jars uh, as, as being modern English of a particular class kind, not implied by the original Greek. Um, and of course, people made similar complaints about the New English Bible, which was called Donish, and there's nothing worse you can say than that. <laughs> um, but the desire for a Bible that speaks in our idiom is very widespread and is the reason why the King James Version has retreated, even though it remains an icon for people who love English literature. Uh, but those are the two issues that were ra raised about the King James Version, literalism and the question of register. Uh, but um, I wanted to go on and speak briefly about two other questions, which, as I say, I think are not so commonly asked. And the first one, uh, which um, Charlotte raised this morning in relation to the question of differences of genre in the Bible, is should the Bible be translated in the same style throughout? Because all Bibles known to me have their own distinctive style, but it's a distinctive style which is common to the whole of that translation. Uh, we can immediately spot the King James Version when people talk of biblical English, that's what they have in mind and the style is uniform. All the characters in the historical books of the Old Testament, all the people in the Gospels and Acts speak in the same kind of English. A Jacobean English, which we're told was slightly archaic already uh, in the time when it was produced, partly because it was taken from older versions such as Tyndall. Uh, the consistency of style contributes to a sense of the Bible as a single book rather than as a library of books, which biblical scholars used to insist that it really is. And uh, no version of the Bible as a translation does justice to that sense that the Bible is a, a library of books, because it's always in a single style throughout. 
And um, whether the style is archaizing, as in the King James, or very modern, as in Good News, or indeed the Word, it's consistent throughout the whole Bible. And the question I want to ask is, is that a good thing? And I, I want to get into that issue by just picking up one little point in the, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament where I think it arises. And that's the opening two chapters of Luke, the infancy stories in Luke. Luke's gospel, as is well known, is generally in quite sophisticated Greek. And we would be correct in translating it into smooth and literary English, differently perhaps from Mark's rather more angular style. But if we do that, then we would have to translate the nativity and infancy stories in Luke 1 and 2 into a more biblical style, since they're surely written in imitation of the Greek version of similar narratives in the Old Testament, such as the birth of Moses or Samson. There is a much more biblical flavour to these chapters than to the rest of Luke, and surely marking this is just as important in its way as getting the words accurately translated. A sense of continuity with the biblical past is communicated by these chapters. A translation that fails to capture that is missing something. And the same thing seems to me to be true about the book of Revelation in the New Testament. That is written in a biblical way. That's to say it's meant to sound like a piece of the Old Testament, um, despite the fact that it hardly ever quotes any particular Old Testament passage verbatim. And so I could imagine a version of the New Testament, a version of the Bible, in which the body of Luke Acts was rendered in good contemporary literary English, while Luke 1 and 2 and Revelation were left in the King James Version. Uh, or a tidied up version of it, like the old Revised Standard Version. All homogenised modern translations flatten out this important stylistic contrast. Now that sounds like a modest proposal, but of course, as you know, in the history of literature, modest proposals sometimes turn out to have uh, a bit of danger in them. And um, this proposal this seems to me to have some rather profound knock-on effects. Because if we were to do what I've suggested, how then would we translate the narratives in the Old Testament itself? The normal precept for, precept for a biblical translator nowadays is to translate the text as though it were our contemporary. In other words, to try to recreate the effect it will have had on the people who first read it. And in the case of the Lucan prologue, I've suggested the effect that will have had on its first readers is a slightly archaic one, harking back to the stories in the Old Testament. But those stories in the Old Testament will presumably have struck their original hearers as contemporary stories in which people spoke normal classical Hebrew. Whereas in, Bibli in Luke 1 to 2, the characters don't speak normal Koine Greek, but rather biblical Greek, modeled on the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So we translate the Old Testament stories in contemporary English. But then, of course, they lose their resonance with what we've now done with Luke 1 and 2, which ends up stranded in an archaic idiom to which nothing in the Old Testament any longer corresponds. That might make us ask, actually, the rather useful question whether the Old Testament stories really struck their original readers as being in current style. Are they actually written in the Hebrew people spoke normally in Old Testament times, or are they too in a conscious literary style deemed appropriate for tales of long ago? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure anybody does, but it is a question that if I was just bouncing some questions off, that does arise in the mind. So should we perhaps render, you know, the books of Judges and Samuel in K King James Version English and reserve our ordinary modern English for, say, kings, which perhaps is nearer to a contemporary description of events? I don't know. But maybe there should be a variety of styles in the Bible, depending on factors such as these, so that characters in some books should speak biblical English while other characters speak in modern English. Once you start to think about the problem of translating Luke from the point of view I've outlined, this issue then raises its head. And it goes on to make us wonder, what do we mean by the original hearers or readers of the Bible? This is a moving target. It depends on what, when we think the various books were written. It's easier to say we should render the text as it will have struck its first readers. And that implies it should be translated into normal modern English just as it struck their ears in what was then normal modern Hebrew or normal modern Greek, modern from their point of view. But that implies we're going to translate, say, Isaiah as his word struck hearers in the 8th century BC. Parts of Genesis may be as they struck readers in the 6th. Ezra as it struck readers in the 4th. 
the Gospels as they struck readers in the first century AD, and so on. If we do that and use modern English throughout, we then produce a text quite unlike any other literary work in the world, in which we translate the various stages in the development of language and style into the same modern idiom. The problem does occur with other works. David Bellos, in his little a popular book on translation, Is That a Fish in Your Ear, which I won't, the title of which I won't attempt to explain, as he comments, uh, in the Penguin classics of the post-war period, which I certainly kind of grew up on and was my first introduction to world literature, these provided translations of great classics of world literature, but every one of the 200 or so volumes reads as if it were written in the same period and in the same surroundings. So he says it's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's a valid point. There's something odd about that. Sh should that be the case? Should they all read as though they were written in the 50s? Um, I don't know. We need to indicate distance as well as closeness. And by that I don't just mean distance from us, but distance of one book from another. And within the Bible, which is, covers such a long period, we surely in our translation should somehow indicate that the books are not all contemporary with each other. A final sort of canonical view of the scripture, of course, makes them contemporary with each other. But from a historical translation point of view, that is a misunderstanding. To put it simply, if we make Isaiah speak like Ezra, then we are falsifying the speech of one or other of them because they speak different kinds of Hebrew. We're losing the sense that Ezra will have had that Isaiah was writing long ago, and we're losing the sense that Isaiah would have had, if he could have heard or read Ezra, that ways of speech has changed since his day. Those senses would be missing. And our translations, all of them, whether traditional or modern, flatten out these differences by adopting one consistent style throughout. Now, the only solution to this problem, uh, and here, of course, we run off into absurdity, actually, but the only solution would be a series of biblical translations that rendered a book first as it may have sounded to its original readers, then as read by people a couple of centuries later, and so on, till we reach the Old Testament as read in New Testament times. And the last would require an archaic idiom throughout the Old Testament, and the King James Bible probably does the job for us, although that sounded more nearly contemporary to its original readers than it does to us, so that's still a problem. The New Testament could then be translated into modern English, and has recently been splendidly done so by, by Nick, um, except perhaps for the archaizing bits, such as the Luke and Prologue and Revelation, I don't know. Uh, but to complete the picture, we might also want a translation of the New Testament as it will have been heard by Christians in, say, the third century. That would be an interesting experiment, too. Um, and perhaps in places we should even make it sound non-grammatical to explain why some of the fathers thought the style was very poor. And indeed, the style is quite poor in some parts of the New Testament. Perhaps that should be marked. I don't know. Well, this, as I say, is ridiculous. Nobody would want to read or buy these multiple Bibles. But it might be interesting to try rendering one or two biblical books in a variety of styles like this, just as really as a kind of heuristic exercise in translation. Given how many translations of the Bible into English are being produced all the time, each with a distinctive style, it might not be bad for a few translators to divert their labors into producing some, as one might call them, reception history versions of important books, so that we could hear how, say, to Samuel, will have sounded not only when it was written, but also during later periods and in New Testament times. Of course, this raises then immediately historical critical issues about the text. If we were translating Isaiah in this way, how would we deal with the fact that the book of Isaiah may contain material from as much as six centuries, six different centuries? Would one have to translate the supposedly genuine sayings of the prophet Isaiah differently depending on whether one was interested in the effect they will have had on his contemporaries or in how they would have sounded to the author of Second Isaiah living in the sixth century. And there's even a question then about underlying documents or meanings that the finished text has ditched. And I give as an example here the first verse of Genesis, which we all know is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But it's possible that at some stage in the development of the book it actually meant in the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void. In other words, that it was a temporal clause, not um, a, a simple narrative statement that God did create, but 
something that describes what was going on when he was creating. And that's quite probable because other ancient Near Eastern creation stories similarly start normally with a subordinate temporal clause of this sort. By the time the Bible was anything like complete, it was certainly taken to mean, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But I notice that a number of modern translations, including the New Revised Standard Version, do go for the temporal clause. Now in that, they're not translating the Bible as it appears to us, or as it appeared to its final readers, but reconstructing a supposedly earlier stage in the meaning of Genesis, which it abandoned as time went by. Now, is that a good idea, or is it a bad idea? I, I don't know for sure, but it seems to me it does raise, again, an interesting issue. Um, modern translations that opt for the subordinate clause rendering are reconstructing a stage behind the final version of Genesis. Just as much as the New English Bible was doing, when, for example, it rearranged some of the speeches in Job to make them more coherent, or eliminated the headings to the Psalms as later editions. That was what the New English Bible did quite freely, and its revision in the Revised English Bible restored the order of the speeches in Job and stuck the Psalm headings quickly back in again. But they were doing a kind of critical job, saying that there was a form of the text that didn't have these things or that was differently arranged, and we should translate that. So again, that's a thought of theoretical question that I think needs to be asked. The only way to avoid these questions is to adopt what is nowadays called a canonical approach, in which we read the Bible as our text, the ever-relevant, complete book that the church canonized. And in that case, we can presumably render it into completely contemporary English. It won't settle the question of register and style, but it will settle the question of whether we should um, aim at modern or archaizing English, and it will say we should aim at modern English. The second question I wanted to raise, which seems to me unasked on the whole for the, by the modern Bible translator, is the problem posed by the existence of the King James Version in English. There are parallel problems in some other languages. The existence of the Luther Bible is a similar problem in German, uh, and I don't know enough of biblical translations in other languages to comment meaningfully on it, but I assume there are parallel problems. New translations of works that have been much translated always face the problem of how they are to manage to tiptoe around the classic translation people already know. And I give as an example in my paper, Dorothy L. Sayers translated Dante's Divine Comedy um, rather memorably for actually the Penguin Classics. And the inscription over the gate of hell in her version reads, cast hope aside, you that go in by me. Now in doing that, she was translating, not just translating, I think very adequately and very memorably the Italian line. She was also deliberately not translating it as abandon hope or leave it enter here, which is the version that all English speakers who know anything about Dante have in their memories. A time may come, indeed may already have come, when very few people know the classic translation of that line. And similarly, there are many people who have no familiarity at all with the King James Version. Uh, and for them, a wholly new translation will simply be the Bible. But for many in Britain and in the English-speaking world, the King James Version remains in some sense the Bible. In some of the events of 2011, it was lauded as a monument of English prose, almost as though the translators actually wrote it all themselves from scratch, I remember <laughs> noticing this. <laughs> um, I mean, there was the suggestion that it's to King James uh, or not always distinguished from the King James translators, by the way, and sometimes referred to as St. James, I know it's rather implausibly. Um, it, was, it was sometimes suggested that it's to them that we owe the memorable line, let there be light. And some people said, no, no, we owe it to Tyndall. Well, we owe it to the Hebrew writer of Genesis uh, in this sense, that it's as obvious a translation of the Hebrew as you could really come up with in English. Um, and this kind of mistake illustrates to just what an extent the King James Bible is the Bible to cure for many people. So that journalists, for example, almost always quote that if they're citing the Bible, say on a moral issue. You always hear, thou shalt not kill, not you shall not kill. Um, uh, I mean, I'm glad that any translation of the Bible still resonates in our culture. I'm not complaining about it. But it does make problems for translators. And I remember when the NEB was published, the New English Bible, 
One reviewer after another wrote about the changes the translators had made to the King James Version, as though they were translating the King James Version into modern English, <laughs> rather than translating works in Hebrew and Greek. And this was irritating to anybody in the sort of biblical studies world, though understandable. What they were trying to do was to translate the original biblical books while deliberately looking away from the King James Version, trying to put it out of their minds. But people in general, I think, did not understand this. Now, when you do this, when you try and translate without attending to the King James Bible, in some cases you'd arrive back where you started, because almost any English rendering of Genesis 1 will probably contain, let there be light. It's hard to see much alternative. The way to avoid it would be to go for a deliberate imitation of Hebrew syntax, and then you'd end up in something like the Buber Rosenzweig, it German translation of the Bible, which deliberately distorted German to mirror the Hebrew. And there is some of that going on in the King James Version, where the English is deliberately made to sound more Hebrew. And then you might say something like, then said God, be light, and was light. I mean, that would be a sort of Buber Rosenzweig version in English of that. But otherwise, I think one would generally um, end up with let there be light. And at this point in the paper, I told the anecdote, which is probably apocryphal, about the fatted calf. But uh, the, 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 the um, translators at the NEB are said to have wanted to find the real modern English for the fatted calf and to have rung up somebody at Smithfield Market and asked, what do you call a, a calf or a, an animal beast which is specially fattened up for a, a feast? And the butcher said, well, it's called a fatted calf. I think there's something about it in the Bible. <laughs> um, but the, the anecdote illustrates the Bible translator's problem. Um, I mean, the, the anecdote suggests, of course, and was told to suggest that there is no need for this newfangled translation because all the terms in King James are still current. That was why the anecdote was fashioned. Um, but, of course, that isn't true. There are whole passages in King James which are very difficult for a modern person to understand and are also probably very inaccurate. Um, but what it does highlight is the fact that King James Version renderings have entered ordinary speech in some cases. And I think that was true of the scum of the earth, wasn't it, in, in, in your paper? Um, and so you can't easily avoid them because people will think you're changing them out of deliberate perversity. It raises the question, is it ever possible to translate a classic text from scratch, particularly one as influential as the Bible? I don't mean is translation impossible, but I, what I mean is can you really successfully translate as if from scratch a, a, a text which people know a classic version of rather well, because that always hovers in the background and gets in the way. Um, the problem is greater with the Bible than with some other classic texts known in the English-speaking world. Uh, I mentioned it's a problem with Dante, but probably a decreasing problem for English readers nowadays. But in the case of the Bible, we have the problem that the English language itself has been shaped and changed by the King James Bible and its predecessors. So there's a kind of uh, feedback loop of some kind going on there. Um, Belos, in the little book I mentioned, argues both English and German would not be the languages they are today without their classic Bible translations. That's always said of German, that the German language was to some extent manufactured as a unified entity by Luther in his Bible. And although that's not quite the case for the English Bible, Nonetheless, it was very influential. It put a lot of words into the vocabulary and lots of turns of phrases, turns of phrase. Um, it's less true, I suppose, of Romance languages, which have mostly corresponded with traditionally Catholic cultures in which the Bible was not so important in the past as it is nowadays. But nevertheless, there may be uh, instances of it there which I'm unaware of. Um, the King James Bible is important in the development of English. And the translators, like their predecessors, tended to lean towards literality rather than freedom, though they didn't interfere with English grammar and syntax in the interests of a supposed fidelity to the original. But with many idioms, they did not seek out English equivalents, but transported the Hebrew ones into English, so that through English translations of the Bible, not necessarily King James, but its predecessors, we get stiff-necked for stubborn, and we get hard-hearted for hard-hearted, um, <laughs> though what we, we didn't get long-nosed for merciful, but we might have done. We might have had, he's, he's being very long-nosed today, we might find ourselves saying. 
meaning, meaning merciful. The problem is that the English Bible, as people say of Shakespeare, is full of quotations. And they won't go away out of our heads when we either write or read a modern translation. Our language is full of idioms that come from the King James Bible in the first place, so that trying to avoid them is even harder than trying to avoid the familiar in translations of other classic texts. Now my point in closing about these two questions I'm asking is just that I don't think biblical translators always consider them. Some do, I'm sure, but a lot seem not to. Biblical translation, to use the current jargon, is somewhat under-theorised. Now you can have too much theory and it can mess you around, but you can perhaps have too little. Uh, biblical translators tend to be innocent of the world of translation studies, I think. And that may be a good thing in some ways, because they think these things through themselves. But um, it can mean that they don't notice questions that I think in the translation of another text would face people and which they would try to do something about. Um, I suggest that both the questions I've asked about what we mean by the Bible's original readers and about how we deal with the fact that there is already a canonical translation of it that's infiltrated our everyday speech could do with more attention than they currently get. Yes, yeah, so on the first one, I mean, you could say you can translate um, the greeting of the angel in a high style, a medium style, or a low style. Now, high babe is a low style, if you like, or a low register. Um, I'm not suggesting you uh, should do it. No, 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 quite. Right. But I mean, I mean, the 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 um, modern normal approach would be the middle to say we translate it as a respectful greeting by an, a person to another person. Uh, but we don't say, hail thou that art highly favoured, which is too high a register, perhaps, and Luther would probably have thought that too. But of course, um, the thing is that for Luther, as for most people of that period, the Bible is a single consistent document. And the trouble if you do modern biblical study is that for you it isn't a single consistent document. And that's the thing we can never get round. Uh, and yeah. why, I mean, I'm, I'm suggesting this really as a kind of thought experiment rather than as an actual proposal for translation. I know it won't come off. But if we take biblical criticism and study seriously, then the Bible is a collection of books of different periods and different styles and registers. And it's, I think it's a shame that's not marked. But it, it wasn't marked for King James translators, nor is it marked for Luther, because for both of them, it is a unified holy book. Yes. Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the consistency and the, the differences between genre, I find really interesting because the voice say that they have definitively tried to do different styles, so you can hear the voice of the authors, and yet they still have an editorial panel who decided how you should translate Christos, how you should translate you know, these to great terms that went across the three. So they kind of impart, they, they've asked these authors to do all this work, and then they go, oh, well, apart from when you're translating Christ, because that means liberating king liberating as far as king, we're concerned. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you um, could comment a bit on um, maybe the King James Version influence on lexicons, because I found it very difficult to find anything that, that wasn't at least 50 years old or based on earlier kind of earlier lexicons. And so that means that the translators have to either do a lot of work to, to look and spend hours on, on extra textual mm. stuff, or, mm. you know, we, so you end up translating Diaco Sinea's righteousness, because mm. that's one of the options we've that's, got, and it's the one I like best, but. That's one of the standard dictionary versions, you mean, mm. rather than inventing a term or. Yes, or yeah, term. yeah, or, yes. or searching around for, yes. for something more modern, we, you know. Yeah, so Nick, I think, if I bring you in, I mean, you've done a lot of, I mean, perhaps not with Dick you know, but with lots of other words, you have come up with modern. Yeah. Yes, uh, but the danger is, as you were indicating earlier, that give it a few years, it should be seen absurdly out of date. That's mm -hmm. of course a danger. Yeah. Yes. But I, I, I recognise that, you know, I see what you were saying, but the, the, the scholarship behind the translation is usually out of date. Yeah, I just, I just wonder how much of the King James version yeah. terms have become our kind of yes, it's standard sort of where we give six or seven options. Yeah. Perhaps mm -hmm. we need a new translation for each generation. Well, we probably do. And we get one on now, yes. in English. Mm -hmm. Yes. For my sins, I was the managing editor of the 400th anniversary edition of the King James published <laughs> by the Bible. Uh -huh. Well done. <laughs> we yes. included a glossary mm -hmm. which amounted in the end to an excessive Terms. Mm -hmm. And the way we did that was very unsubtle in the end. We, we thought of all sorts of subtle ways of doing this, <laughs> and then by the time we got to the end of thinking about it, we realised that it really wasn't that much helpful. We simply sort of um, a lexicon from the in James, a lexicon from the good news, and we looked at the stuff that didn't match. Mm -hmm. And so we had words that were in the King James lexicon, and there was no surface form of them anywhere um, that they could use. We said probably they're not generally in current use mm -hmm. um, within this sort of context yeah. in the language today. And we ended up with an awful lot more than we had thought we would when mm -hmm. we started. But it was an interesting exercise. And that would be at least one way yeah. if you were to take that and we would be able to find out where yeah. the words were. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. So take a, a, a lexicon or word that's based on a very old translation, one based on a very new one. Yes. And you have to do a certain amount of work and emphasizing the service form and such like this. In English, that's true, but yeah. speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, we have that information already. So it was simply right. a matter of saying, we've got one this here, we've got one this there. Where's the other one? What's falling out? How can we help people by putting mm -hmm. those into an explanatory process? I, I like that you did that, though, because it's one of my problems with the King, the way people talked about the King James in, in lots of those programs at the time, was they didn't comment that what you're essentially doing when you read it is a second tier translation anyway. You read it and then you translate it back into your own head and go, oh, what I think they mean by this is, <laughs> yes. because it's not the language you speak all yes. the time. So even if you recognise it, there is this extra level going yeah. on. One of the things that, that fascinated me in what you put for us was uh, the Genesis 1 problem, mm. oh, yes. um, in part because I'm interested in the origin of creation. And as a result of that, I'm very well aware that by at least the 13th century, and probably before that, if you had the temerity to suggest within Christianity or Judaism that creation ex nihilo wasn't the only way to understand that, you were heretical. That's right. Okay. And, and yeah. mm -hmm. how do you translate Genesis 1 well, now, given the four factor in council of your Christian? Exactly. Says, I mean, that, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the Hebrew of Genesis one is capable of being read in either way. It has to be said. I think it's not definitive, but was certainly read by, shall we say, New Testament times, in the in the form we have it in King James, or in, you know, and, and the form that 
that came to be fully canonical that in the beginning God created and that it was a creation ex nihilo. Yeah. And what that brings in for me is precisely what you're using for, to say well, which mm. context? Mm. Mm. Whose context? But it, it, for me, raises the question of you know, which stage in the development of the text are we trying to translate? And it's, it's not answerable, really. It's one of those questions you can... But it, I just wanted... The before dinner talk, you see, just bouncing, <laughs> bouncing, just bouncing a few thoughts around. You know. A friend of mine who likes teasing flat earthers always suggests, once upon a time, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice one. Which works. Well. Yes, it does. <laughs> My question was partly stolen by Charlotte, because I was going to ask about the feedback into lexicons, yeah. which I think is actually a universal problem. Because most lexicons are based on medieval Vulgate translations, and there's no theorizing about it. And yes. I, I know a distinguished lexicographer who says most lexicographers actually work with translations in their mind, and they're lexicographing the translation. And it's very bold to come up with a lexical definition, which is not a standard one. So the King James, I would say, is universal, even if we don't use some of the words yes. King James, the actual meaning still come back to the words of King James. Yeah. Why do we say Ba'ar to create? <clears throat> because it actually there are many different ways we could translate that. It's to fashion, to mold, to produce, to divide, <laughs> if yeah. we follow one, yeah. one view. But people react against it, you don't say to create. So That's great. That's great. Great. There, there's a very, very deep problem with lexicography. Mm. So translators are using lexicons influenced by King James and also using translations in their mind. That's in the <coughs> a lot of circularity going on. Exactly. I, I published one example of this in 2000 of um, Coverdale translation ending up in Middle and Scott, even though it was a misunderstanding. Yeah. Actually, through, went from Coverdale to Brenton, who favoured Coverdale, and then into Middle and right. Scott, which is quite a bit shocking. Was it from the Coverdale Psalms, by any chance? Yes. Yes, it was. Because yes. all, all Anglican clergy, you know, uh, uh, until very recently, r recited the Coverdale Psalms in their office. Yeah, and the Gospel um, wrote a uh, and, uh, book about it. Yeah, and although it's very pre precedes King James by a long way, uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of canonical in our heads. Um, so if I think of a verse in the Psalms, I immediately think of the Coverdale version. And, that, that's risky from this point of view, isn't it? Because it's based on very little knowledge of Hebrew, actually. <laughs> it's translated mainly from the Latin. I would just add, when you talk about Bible translators, we have to be careful. In England and America, when you want to translate the Bible into English, you get biblical scholars in universities. But actually, Bible, professional Bible translators are oh. very theorised. United Bible yes, Societies I, I are see that. at the cutting yes. edge of translation. Yes. So it's actually a mistake of England and American Bible translations. translations the translations in English specifically are not theorised, <coughs> but into other languages they are. Yes, and I, I, that's true and important, I think. And it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting how far translation, um, discussion of biblical translation, um, what I've just done as an example of it, is focused on the whole in translation, on translation to English, um, or certainly into major European languages, whereas most biblical translation in the world is done into languages which in some cases have not had any written material in them before. And that, that's, that's quite a different situation. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.